Thank you. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending where you are in Europe, uh, and, and welcome to this uh, session in, in SOC final conference about advancing SSH research with shockingly good and sustainable resources. And the session is how to become a shockingly trustworthy environment for SSH data. So my name is Marie Klemola. I'm from the Finnish Social Science Data Archive uh, and uh, Tampere University and SESTA. And uh, I, I'm here today to moderate the discussion uh, with our four speakers. Um, and then this is the program for this session and we are starting a few minutes late and, and I'm very sorry about that, but hopefully everybody online and here is, is, is uh, at the place. So uh, we will have, as I mentioned, four presentations and they uh, have all a very distinct angle, angle at this tr trustworthiness and the data environment and where data lives and they bring into the discussion and under the table uh, all these different viewpoints. Uh, but basically we are all in the same landscape uh, and the landscape is uh, well, maybe it's an EOSC landscape, what we did here uh, uh, by Francisca uh, in, in last session, that we actually don't need EOSC. Uh, so we have our own identity, uh, or we will have our own identity, and, and we have our own services and practices, and, and we can bring those into EOSC. Uh, but in, in the European landscape, I think EOSC is something that is coming up everywhere. You can't avoid EOSC, and that's, I think, also part of the landscape here. And uh, when I was thinking of these presentations and how to set the scene, uh, the, and then when the word landscape uh, was mentioned and when the word uh, vision was mentioned, so this is the, the picture that came to my mind and I hope you can see it. So it's uh, from a uh, paper by uh, Herve Lourdes and Ilona uh, Stein, uh, and this was done, it's not an official face fair project, uh, deliverable, but it was done during that project. And I, I think it's a very nice picture of, uh, of, of a fair ecosystem and the components, and it provides a vision. So this is not the final truth or the, not the only truth, uh, or, and we can also debate if it's the truth, uh, but it's, I think, a nice picture. And the presentations that we will see today in this session, I think, fit into this. Um, maybe we will be able to recognize things that are missing from this picture. Uh, as well when you look at it. So I'm, I'm, I think we can come back to this uh, after we've heard the presentations and, and see what's fitting, what's not fitting, if something is missing, how we see uh, this vision. And uh, I'm, I also know that Herve is planning an update on this, so I'm, I'm sure he will be happy of uh, all the feedback he can get. Uh, but without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our speakers today, and we will start with my colleague, uh, Henry Alalahti from, uh, well, since he is a colleague, so that's also Tampere University, uh, Finnish Social Science Data Archive, and SESTA, and Henry has been working with us for uh, on and off now for 10 years in, in various tasks, and most lately in, in SOC task 8.2 about the certification uh, support for repositories. And Henry is presenting online, so uh, I'm looking at the tech people. What do we do? Okay. And Henry, I guess you will be sharing your screen or your presentation? I will. Okay, thank you. The floor is yours. I hope you can see my screen now. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. And good, good afternoon or good morning here from Helsinki. Uh, I will be telling you a bit about the activities of Task 8.2, uh, particularly from the perspective of user communities and core trust seal certification. And I should note that I'll be talking about users in two senses. Uh, the first is the users of our support activities, meaning repositories 
and the second is the data uses of these repositories. Uh, but first, let's take a so, quick look at the, uh, the purpose of the task and the team. So our main goal was to bolster and improve trust uh, and quality of shop repositories. This was mainly done by supporting repositories with trusted digital repository certification. Uh, in practice, this meant uh, using the core trust seal. And the main, there are a number of reasons for using the core trust seal, which are that it was it's approachable for first timers. It's not too labor intensive. Uh, it's community driven and open to feedback and it's suitable for heterogeneous data repositories and services, and it's quite flexible. It's also core, it has fairly basic requirements, so this, this is also makes it easier for first-timers to, to pursue. And finally, a practical reason, it was, it's also familiar to most of our task members, so that made it easier for us to provide some support to the repositories applying for it. And other activities of our task in, involved exploring the shock trust landscape, and I will be telling you a bit about that in a, in a moment. And also providing the core trust seal board with feedback uh, about the certification support process and the experiences of, of our report, supported repositories. And as you can see on the slide, uh, our task team had a good representation from various shock organizations. It consisted of 10 people from seven organizations from four major shock infrastructure, infrastructures. So, focusing on three of our main activities that had a user focus. The first and the most important one was the certification support, as mentioned already, which was aimed at shock repositories that were interested in completing a core trust seal self-assessment to become a trusted digital repository. And the support consisted of sub-activities, sub including one-on-one -on -one support between the repositories and task members. Uh, it also had workshops, and re we reviewed the self-assessment built in by the repositories. There were 14 repositories that were selected uh, through an open call, which was available on the shop website. And the support process began uh, in the autumn of 2020, and it lasted until January or April this year, depending on where the repositories were at, with their uh, self-assessments. So we continued th with those that were closed applying for Core Trust Seal uh, until April, and it's still ongoing with some of them. Um, another thing we did was we conducted a survey of shock, shock organizations that provided any kind of services related to data, and this was conducted in the summer of 2020. Uh, 21, and we received responses from 14 organizations. Uh, in addition, we explored various features of uh, 96 repositories belonging to four shock infrastructures. And this was done by uh, conducting desk research, and this was also done in the summer of 2021. Uh, basically, the desk research involved visiting the websites of the repositories and seeing for example, if they use persistent identifiers, if they describe their designated community, and if they had uh, mission statements and preservation policies available uh, to the public. So I'll tell a bit more about support first. Here you can see the, the 14 supported repositories. And I should note that roughly half of them had a formal cost core trust seal certification as their goal. So the other half, they wanted to participate to gain more insight into what the certification process is like. And they wanted to see, maybe improve their practices, but they didn't have the intention to apply for the formal certification within the timeline. Um, well, the outcomes of the support process are, I'd say, quite positive. Out of the eight repositories that had uh, the formal certification as their goal, three have submitted their application already. Uh, three are about to do so soon. And well, one repository wasn't able to devote as much time on the process as they wanted. And another processed quite nicely, but they were also involved in support from another project. So they decided to continue their self-assessment there. 
And as, as mentioned, six repositories were from the beginning mostly interested in working on the self-assessment to familiarize themselves with the process and to improve their practices. So their involvement varied and some of them made it quite far with their assessments, but they didn't have the intention to actually apply. So all progress was good, good progress with them. And as we drew closer to the end of the project, um, we referred the repositories to trust support provided by their infrastructures whenever this was possible. For instance, SESTA and Clarin provide some support for their repositories. Then other, other outcomes, well, support process revealed that to, to many participating repositories that first time certification does take some time and resources. Uh, it also often requires the involvement of more than one repository expert and sometimes requires contacting uh, the hosting organization or outsourcing partners. And this, uh, this came to as a surprise to, to some. Uh, we also asked the supporters of repositories if they're interested in a, a wider network of trustworthy digital repositories, which is in the works uh, at the moment, to sustain these trust activities after the shop projects and after the EOSC and FAIR Fair projects. Uh, half of the supported repositories showed interest in the network. And well, while this is still in the planning stages, so I don't have many details about the form this network would take as of yet. And based on the feedback we received during the process, um, the repositories found the support helpful in completing the self-assessment as well as identifying what they could do differently to meet these uh, course of field requirements and, and to improve their policies and practices and make them more transparent to users. But you don't just, to, just have to take our word for it. There's, here's one user testimonial that comes from Tomasz Parkowa from the Digital Repository of Scientific Institutes in Poland. Uh, here are a few quotes from Tomasz from a user story that was published by Trust IT and the Shock website. So although the repository is needed to put in the work to themselves to complete the application, uh, the support we provided was seen as speeding up and facilitate, facilitating the, the application dealing with the assessment. But uh, moving on to the survey and the desk research, and to some extent, uh, our bits about find what was deliverable. The main results we found uh, exploring the trust uh, landscape of the shock organizations was that uh, the organizations within shock and the social sciences and humanities field are very diverse. They're particularly particularly diverse in terms of uh, discipline and designated communities, as well as data types they store. And while well, this diversity has already been noted uh, by the other speakers of this conference, I think, and we can here see also the need to bridge the silos that also exist in the certification and trust support work. Um, in addition, repositories may have various and complex partnership models and outsourcing agreements to, pro to provide the service, which may further complicate the certification process. So this is something to take into account as well. Now, because of the diversity of the organizations and data services they provide, it's challenging, uh, if not impossible, to find a one-size-fits-all certification solution. Uh, the survey results showed that in addition to repositories, there are several other organizations that offer data services, but they do not necessarily store data in the long term, which doesn't really qualify them then for existing qualification schemes. Another major finding of the desk research was that Fortress Seal certification is clearly linked to, to better provision of information, uh, information to users and and increased discoverability of both the repositories themselves and their data. While this might sound self-evident, uh, the things we looked at the desk research were fa fairly basic things that could be expected to be there, whether you're a certified uh, repository or not. So this was a clear indication that the certification process improves uh, the, the information provision. 
in, in our sample, uh, members of certain shock infrastructures were also more likely to be certified than others. Uh, there can be several reasons for this, but one of the most obvious ones is the fact that some infrastructures already recommend or even require their repositories to seek Culture Steel certification. Now, I should also note some limitations of the results. Um, the, these results mainly provide insight into specialist and domain or disciplinary uh, repositories because generalist repositories were not very well represented in the survey or the desk research. Uh, also, the selection of organizations in the survey and desk research was not random. Uh, these were purposefully selected, so there's a limited generalizability there. Also, regarding the, the support process, the feedback we, we have received is mainly from first-time applicants to support of seal. So it appears that support is mainly needed by repositories that have no experience of or trust seal. We don't know if three applicants would also need some support, but it, it could be expected that first timers, of course, need more support than the re applicants. Um, moving on to conclusions and next steps. Uh, one of our conclusions was that despite the, the challenges of finding certification solution that would fit all, Core Trust Seal already does the job quite well. Even though it cannot respond to all the needs of all organizations offer offering data services, it does comprise the core criteria that really cannot be narrowed down without watering down the, the whole point of certification. And at the other end of the scale, our conclusion was that Core Trust Seal should not be extended too much either, so that it actually remains core and achievable as many as as many repositories as possible. Um, even if official certification is not possible for an organization, our support process showed that self-assessment against the CTS requirements is a good way of seeing what's expected of trustworthy repositories, and doing so improves the, the documentation and practices. Um, and I should also note that, well, sustainable management of trust is not contingent on certification alone, and it should it probably shouldn't be the goal itself. Uh, certification can be used to demonstrate uh, trustworthiness, and you can improve your practices by doing so. But it really is the everyday work with your uh, designated community and users where you actually earn that trust. And the cooperation should be noted as well. Cooperation is needed with uh, the social sciences and humanities community to set the common goals and agree on what should be expected from trustworthy repositories. And this collection of feedback to the Core Trust Seal Board is one of the activities we're doing to, to achieve this. And this relates to the sustainability of trust activities after the shock project as well. Like I mentioned, some infrastructures already have trust support in place, and there are plans to establish uh, a network of trustworthy digital repositories and well, at the end of the project, it's really, in the end, really requires collaboration and coming together. And I would say that based on our results, there really, there clearly is a need for more trust support in the future. Um, here are the links to our publications. Please take a closer look at them if you're interested in the results in more detail. And that's all from me for, for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry. Uh, are there any immediate questions online? No? Or from the audience here? I see no hands, so I think we can move to the next presentation and uh, we will have all the questions in the end. Um, so the next uh, presentation is about uh, GDPR and it will be given by Marianne Hockett-Weit Muren, uh, and, uh, who heads the section for data protection services at SICT, that used to be NSD. Uh, the unit provides guidance to institutions, researchers, and students on privacy protection, and also provides data protection officers for 10 research institutions. And she has worked with uh, data protection issues in different law roles at SICT or NSD for seven years, and uh, she has also led uh, work packages uh, 
uh, on, on new forms of data, legal, ethical and quality issues in, in a former EU project called CERIS. Uh, and I think many of you might have participated in that as well. So uh, welcome. Thank you, Marie. Okay. So, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Marianne. Uh, the wrong presentation. I can talk about trust. <laughs> but may maybe not as well as Helen. No, not that one either. Do you want me to show you the one? That's the right presentation. <laughs> so hello everyone, I'm Marianne. I'll talk about recommendations for a GDPR code of conduct for SSH. Um, first, an overview of uh, my talk today. I'll start by talking about what are GDPR codes of conduct, uh, topics and scope, challenges, uh, approval process, benefits, necessary next steps, and recommendations. Um, but first, a little bit about the task. Uh, our report uh, is from task 8.3, legal and ethical uh, issues. And our work builds on valuable input from uh, work package five, mainly task 5.3, legal issues of innovative data access. The task in Work Package 5 started the initiative of creating a code of conduct draft. Uh, and our task in Work Package 8 has uh, um, worked further on this initiative. Uh, this has been done by elaborating on the conditions that must be met in order to have a code of conduct approved. Uh, and these conditions, uh, for those of you who are interested, are set up in Article 40 and 41 in the GDPR. Uh, our work has been based on interpretations of the GDPR, published reports, documents and guidelines, and also valuable input from, from and consultations with experts, partners and stakeholders. We have also been following the work of the BBMRI ERICS initiative on a code of conduct for health and life science. There are a lot of terms that needs to be fulfilled in order to get a code of conduct approved, and our report provides a framework that can be used to fulfill these terms in order. Um, uh, in, and in our opinion, such a code should be of great benefit to the EOSC, the research environment, data sharing, and society at large. So what are GDPR codes of conduct? The GDPR is a general law, meaning that it applies to all activities, not only research. A code of conduct can, in accordance with GDPR, be made as a supplement to the GDPR to provide guidance on how to act within the regulation <laughs> in specific areas. Uh, according to the guidelines from the European Data Protection Board, a code of conduct uh, is a set of rules for a specific sector that provides guidelines on how the institution in, in that sector must adapt to comply with the requirements of the GDPR. A code can therefore be understood as a mean to translate the general rules of the GDPR into more sector-specific guidelines. Codes can operate as a rule book 
for institutions to design and implement uh, GDPR compliant data processing activities. A code of conduct is uh, developed by the sector itself and must be formalized through several conditions before it can be, proved, uh, be approved by a supervisory authority. Thus, making a code of conduct is not very easy and it's a comprehensive process, but it's doable. So, what's in it for the uh, SSH community? The aim of SHOC is more sharing of data, more archived data, and more reuse of SSH data. The objective of the GDPR is to protect individuals, but also to facilitate free movement of personal data within the union. However, there are challenges. There are uh, room for member states derogations, especially in the field of research. Uh, and in our opinion, a GDPR code of conduct could be a possible solution to harmonize the landscape in the area of research. Um, if one is to make a code of conduct, one of the things to decide upon is the scope of the code. It's possible to make a broad one and it's possible to make a narrow one. And uh, we have to choose uh, on the material scope the ter and the territorial scope. And if we start with a territorial scope, there are certain advantages to having country-specific codes. It may be easier, uh, it, be, it may be an easier process to both create and implement without the obstacle of different national laws and practices. However, the main purpose of the EOSC is to facilitate data sharing use and reuse within the Union and the EEA. Therefore, our uh, recommendation is to make a code for all EU countries. Uh, in the terms of material scope of a code, there is a wide range of topics to choose from. The scope could be either broad or narrow, and there are advantages and disadvantages related to both the alternatives. With a broad scope, the code could serve as a framework for compliance with all or many of the articles in the GDPR. Uh, the, the advantage of such a code would be that it provides GDPR standards and tools for the entire research process. The main disadvantage would be that it requires an enormous amount of work to complete the code. The approach of a narrow scope, on the other hand, would allow the SSH community to focus on how research can comply with one or a few articles in the GDPR and set standards for a smaller part of the research process. It's also an easier way to start. So our suggestion in the report is to start with, for instance, a lawful basis for processing personal data for research purposes as a first step. And just to show you, <laughs> to get a, a code of conduct approved, approved, there are a lot of um, requirements. So moving on, if one de uh, decides on the material and the territorial scope, uh, I, I'm not going to read all of them, but one of the steps um, are to, uh, to determine which organization have the mandate to draft the code and so on. <laughs> And you need support, you need to, uh, a lot of consultation, and uh, you need to, to decide which supervisory authority should assess and approve the code. If you make a European code, that may be an issue. <laughs> which country? Uh, should it be Norway? Should it be Germany? And so on. Uh, another issue is to identify a monitoring body for the code. Uh, you also need to decide on the language and ensure that it, the code is compliant with national legislation. And for instance, legal basis in Finland, they, they often go for public interest as a legal, lawful basis. In Spain, they normally use consent. So there are variation and there's also a north-south divide. So, as mentioned earlier, making a code is time-consuming and requires a lot of work. 
Uh, and there are a lot of requirements that needs to be in place and it must be formalized before it can be approved by a supervisory authority. Uh, and it will also probably be challenges, challenging, challenging to, for instance, decide on the material and the territorial scope of the code. We've also been following the work of the BBMRI, Eric, who are making a code of conduct for health research. And they, I think they started in 2015. I was at a meeting in 2017. And they're still struggling to decide <laughs> how to make the code and where to start. And I, I think they're now landing on an FAQ as a starting point. But, but uh, I remember I was in Brussels and they started talking about how to define personal data. So, I mean, you can do it in very many different ways. Um, yeah, another challenge, a uh, central one, is which body should monitor the code. This because of the fact that the monitoring body is given a lot of responsibility. So, so both the BBMRI, Eric, and also other initiatives has told us that uh, choose the choice of a supervisory authority and also of a monitoring body are central challenges. And finally, uh, also, uh, if you are to make a code of conduct, the sector needs to be uh, engaged and work closely together, which can also be an issue uh, because everybody else have a lot of other things to do. So, given all the challenges, it may seem unnecessary to invest a lot of work in creating and agreeing on formal guidelines in terms of an SSH GDPR code of conduct. After all, the sector has already established various templates and best practices that seem to work relatively well. Nevertheless, it can be argued that the formalization of guidelines through an approved code of conduct has many advantages. One of them uh, is that it will facilitate harmonization of the GDPR across EU and EEA for the SSH community. The EC has also highlighted the creation of the use and use of codes of conduct as an important tool to achieve a harmonized practice of the GDPR. Using standards for the processing of personal data can, for instance, make it easier to allow research data to be shared and used over time and across countries within Europe. This will in turn facilitate cross-border research cooperation and long-term reuse of research data collected in different European countries. In sum, a code of conduct can make it easier for the SSH environment to operate in accordance with the GDPR and at the same time facilitate data access and use. It may also reduce the uh, administ administrative burdens of demonstrating compliance uh, with the GDPR and reduce risks of sanctions and correlating reputational loss as acting in accordance with the code will be within the rules set in the regulation because it's approved by a supervisory authority. And then, so now, so now what? Uh, moving forward, if the SSH is to make a code of conduct, there are some necessary next steps, which I've listed here. First, one needs to consult with the sector to identify and document its specific needs. One needs to find and agree on an organization or a body that can represent the SSH environment. One needs to determine the scope an identified and designated monitoring body. Uh, one needs to determine mechanisms to ensure transparency and monitor compliance. Sorry, one second. I'm struggling with, with my voice these days. Uh, one also needs to determine a supervisory authority, ensure compliance with national legislation, and meet the language requirements for a draft code. So, in sum, <coughs> to sum up, <coughs> I almost made it. <laughs> Just one sec. 
You can read the statement, it's very grand. <laughs> <laughs> To sum up, there are a lot of terms that needs to be fulfilled in order to get a code of conduct approved. Our report provides a framework that can be used to fulfill these terms in order to make a draft code of conduct for SSH research that in the end can be approved by a supervisory authority. Uh, we recommend that the work of establishing an SSH GDPR code of conduct is continued for the benefit of EOSC, the European Research Environment, data sharing, and also society at large. A future roadmap for establishing an SSH GDPR code of conduct could be, a plan, could be to plan the next steps as a proposal under uh, a new Horizon Europe call, or to get the ERICs uh, to establish a working group who could take this initiative further. Thank you very much. Any questions? Or should we have them? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What are the terms? Uh, do we have a long answer? <coughs> what do you get to? If, if, if you have a, yeah. If you have this SSH code, uh, do you see any problem? Is there a need for every member state as well as to give it a go? Could that be a problem for implementing such a thing? Not, Ina, would you comment? I, d I don't not necessarily because it's it's for the pe I mean, it's for the people who wants to be part of the code. So it, so if a member state didn't want to participate, it wouldn't be included. Thank you. So I think it would be up to each member state if they want to join, but hopefully as many as possible would join, join the code because it would be in fact easier to, to do what um, the, the main message of shock would be and uh, for EOS, for data sharing and so on and so forth. It's, it's about compliance. Yeah. If you, you, if you join the code, you will be compliant. And, and also the EC has said if you, if you join a code, the fines will be lower, for instance, if there is a data breach or something. Yeah, but that moves the decision making. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, sorry. Who, who's the decision maker of being compliant? That's the monitoring body. I mean, it yeah. needs to be approved, and then you need to find a monitoring body, and then the monitoring body, if, if there are questions, they need to decide. So, so it's, it's been a struggle, I, I think, from the other initiatives to find someone who wants to be a monitoring body because it's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And this monitoring body and supervising authority, who is going to fund them? Is everybody going to pay? So it's going to be an agreement, a memorandum of understanding? What, how is this going to be organized? Do you have an idea? And that's, that's a good question. Uh, the supervisory authorities are already established in each member state. So they are funded by the government, but the monitoring body, don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marianne. I, I think uh, a lot of challenges, but it was nice to hear you say that it's doable. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I, although I'm a little bit worried uh, uh, by the example of uh, BBMRI, so if it's been now on the pipeline for several years already. But let's see. Uh, from this, I, I, I think uh, we can go to our next presentation and that will be about a pilot on secure connection, also part of this uh, EOSC landscape or the services or the vision. Uh, and, and this presentation will be given by Deborah Wiltshire and she heads up the secure data center at GESIS and has worked in many roles from data collection and access to data analysis. She has worked in secure data havens for seven years, specializing in ensuring safe and ethical use of secure data, research training, and statistical disclosure control. So, please. Okay, thank you.
thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Um, so I'm Deborah. I'm based at Gizis in Cologne now, previously in the UK. You may detect I, I don't sound very German. Uh, yet, yet, I'm practicing. Um, so I want to talk to you about the work we've been doing, and it feels like we've, we've actually achieved a huge amount over the last few months, so I'm really excited to be able to share some of the, the work that we've been doing. So our work package has been under task 5.4, which is looking at innovations in data access. And very specifically, we've been looking at remote access to sensitive data. Now, sensitive data, excuse me, too sensitive, um, are data that are highly detailed and potentially disclosive. So they have to be accessed only through secure access um, systems. And everybody on our work package, um, we come from Germany, the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, so we're, we, we span quite a bit of Europe. And we all work within secure data access in some form. Our key objectives really are quite simple, and they have been to look at how we provide guidance and recommendations for future infrastructure, but also to provide guidance and recommendations for new and existing secure data access services. So secure data access is, is not new. There's a lot of development happening, but it's not entirely new. Some of us have been around for, for quite a while. But we've also been looking at how we can build some new infrastructure, but also how we can support the existing sector and the in existing infrastructure and the people that work within this system. So that's really been our main goal. So as I say, we have, we have been quite busy over the last sort of couple of years. I joined the, um, the group relatively recently towards the end of last summer. So I want to go through the key deliverables that we've been working on um, and, and just give you a, a flavour of what we've been up to. So I've, I've separated them into sort of three categories, if you like. So this first one is focused very heavily on um, guidance and recommendations. So this started with some work to carry out an assessment of existing remote desktop platforms. And what the team did was gather information about 13 already established platforms. And that can be from secure data access facilities down to platforms which have a specific role, such as um, automated statistical disclosure. And what we're assessing is to have a look at the legal, organisational and technical aspects of all of these platforms and services. And this piece of work is already available, so you can go onto the shop website and have a look. This is really fed into the white paper, which is um, now completed. And the aim of this white paper has been to um, provide guidance and recommendations to EOSC primarily for future infrastructure, specifically around remote access for sensitive data in the social sciences and humanities. Now, the goal is always to try and make data access as easy for researchers as possible, but with secure data access, we have to balance the need to keep this data safe so the use of this data has to be legal, it has to be safe, and it has to be ethical. So there are constraints that we work within, but we really try and make that access as, as easy within those constraints. So this, this white paper is really providing um, some guidance, some recommendations, a discussion of the sector as it is. And it's based on the experience and the expertise of those that are working already within these environments. So everybody that's contributed 
were active in a secure data facility of some sort. Now, this provides in some ways an aspirational vision for providing um, and expanding access to these types of data. But because we're all involved in this sector already, it's very much grounded in a very practical way. And it's based on, on the practical experience of this. So that's the first sort of chunk of work. The second chunk of work is really around setting up um, or expanding the infrastructure a little bit. And there is a couple of things to talk about here. So the first piece of work was to develop a framework and a contract for international data use agreements. Now these can be quite tricky to put together for all sorts of reasons, different legal landscapes in different countries, different minimum requirements that that each country has, et cetera, et cetera. But it's very hard when you have systems which are not identical to try and find a middle ground. And I think to try and do this from scratch is actually quite a tricky process. So the good news, we hope, is that we have um, a, a live data access agreement in place between the UK Data Service and GESIS. Now that has a very practical application in the fact that it has now allowed us to open up access between the two organisations. But beyond that, it's there as a blueprint for other organisations who want to do this, this same piece of work. So rather than start from scratch, the agreement is there to be adapted. So it takes, hopefully, some of the headache and, and some of the labour-intensive work out of it. Now, I mentioned that we've opened up access. So this is really, really hot off the press. We've been working to set up a secure remote connection, as I say, between the UKDS Secure Lab and the Secure Data Centre in Jesus. That is live now. Um, it exists. We have tested it, all the technical tests have been successful, and on Friday we had researchers <coughs> in carrying out some research, which is very exciting. Very right, I'm probably a little bit too overexcited by this. <laughs> but we've been closed for two years, the safe room. So this is the first, the first I ever have an actual researcher in. Very, very exciting. Um, sorry, far too excited. Now, this in itself has been a little bit challenging and for, for one very, very key reason is the pandemic has forced us to close our physical locations, which is hard when the goal is to have somebody in a physical location. So this has been a little bit close to the wire and there's been a, a little bit of you know, tension. Will we be able to do this in time? Now, both of the safe rooms are officially still closed, but on Friday we managed to get permission to open up specially to allow researchers in. Sorry, I always wonder. So this is, this is great news. So we have two researchers, one in each country, who put in a research application. They went through the normal approval process, and they have now carried out a piece of research with live data in the safe rooms. So we had a, um, actually a former colleague of mine based in Germany now, accessing UK data from Cologne, and we had a researcher in the UK accessing Giza's data from the UK. So it's, it's, it happened, we made it. So that's really good, and obviously we hope once the safe rooms open formally again, which will be very, very soon, we will have a nice steady stream of researchers who want to come and use this data. As well as that, we've also had the FOR's case study. So this is colleagues in Switzerland have actually done a lot of work in um, opening up a secure room for sensitive data. Um, and they've been doing this again over the, the course of the SHOP project. 
So they carried out an internal needs assessment and they've been interviewing people um, that are involved in different aspects of the organisation, from strategic, legal, technical um, parts of the organisation. And they've built a secure room for sensitive data access. So that's another really, really exciting development. Now, the whole process has been documented and it has been attached to the um, white paper that I mentioned. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, then please do go and have a read. Um, and please do get in touch with, with Thors as well if you want to talk about that a little bit more with. But this is real, real steps forward to expand access. So we're really, really happy about this. So the final part of the deliverables, the final chunk of work, really has been around building resources and building networks. Now, the first chunk happened last year, and this is around training. Now, if we want to move towards remote desktop, i.e. move away from people coming into a safe room, but people remoting in securely from their own institutions, we have to look at training and existing secure um, remote desktop systems will have quite often a mandatory training for researchers to go on before they're allowed access. Now, if you've ever sat and developed one of these, again, it's one of those things that's quite labour intensive and why reinvent the wheel? There are excellent courses out there already. What we've done here is develop our own set of training materials specifically for this. And the aim is that these are a canonical set of materials that anybody can go onto the website, download and adapt for their own use. So again, what we're trying to do is just take some of the work away from people that want to start this up from scratch. We held a workshop last September and we invited people from the secure data access field and we also invited some experienced trainers along and we introduced the materials and asked for people's opinion, people's feedback. Very, very happy, it was very positive. Um, so that's, that's all great, but what it really highlighted for us is the absolute benefit of bringing together data access professionals in a forum of some form. Now, for those of us who work in secure data access, one thing is true that quite often in an organisation there are very few of us. So in my organisation there's two of us, some organisations there might just be one. And that can be quite a lonely place considering the amount of legal responsibility that we carry in these roles. Now, what we did moving on from this is to set up a new network which is specifically to support people in these roles. And here it is, it's the International Secure Data Facility Professionals Network. This will be ongoing, I'll talk about that in just a second, but we held the first meeting a couple of weeks ago. We held it online for obvious reasons. Really, really good turnout and really, really good show of interest from the community. So initially from this first meeting, we've had 22 people sign up as members, which we're happy about. But we also had people who were not able to attend this first meeting, but they emailed in to express interest in attending and joining the network. So that's really encouraging. The aim is really to provide support knowledge exchange, all of those things that we desperately need in these kind of roles. So that's the work that we've been doing, and this is really what we hope the legacy is going to be. So obviously with the white paper, the training materials, all of those things are there, they are available for the community to use as they see fit. So we hope that that will help move this, this work forward. So we hope that organisations who want to consider opening up access to, the, to secure data or develop new facilities, 
they will have a lot more guidance than, than all of us have. So that we hope it will make life a lot easier. In terms of the training materials, we've already had interest in certain organisations within Germany in using and adapting those materials. So we've got Bundesbank, me, because, you know, why not, why not use them? They're great. Slightly biased opinion. Um, I wrote them, by the way. So it's very, very biased. Um, but it's great to, to see that we've already got people interested in working with us to adapt these to their own needs. We've got this remote connection. As I say, it's ready as soon as we can open up our safe rooms. It's ready for researchers to, to come. And really what that allows, as soon as COVID allows, obviously. Um, that allows researchers, for example, in Germany to stop having to travel to the UK and vice versa in order to access these data. So that's for the budget of your average researcher, that is a huge step forward, I think. There's a wide range of data available and what we hope is using the framework of what we've achieved, other connections will, will spring up. The international network that I mentioned We've had the first event, huge success. This is going to carry on. So we already have a steering group. We uh, will run this as a collaboration between the UK Data Service and GISIS. The next um, meeting is already scheduled for September. We've got interest coming in all the time. So we hope that this is going to be a really, really valuable resource for, for those of us who work in this sector. And I think that is it. The audience, but I was maybe I have a question. Um, <laughs> I'm not a, or a data expert, but I was wondering first of all who defines what data needs to be stored in those safe rooms. I would be interested in that. So this is, it varies a little bit from organisation to organisation, but in what tends to happen is that ultimately the data providers will make that decision and they will do it with guidance from the data access provider. So it tends to be a, a, a collaborative approach. Um, I can speak sort of from my own experience from, you know, the UK and, and Germany. That's how it tends to work. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting that different, different data providers will have a little bit of a different appetite for risk. And you'll, you notice that when you work with multiple data providers, that some are extremely risk averse and others are a little bit more laid back. This is anecdotal, I have no research to back this up, but this is just from speaking to data providers. Those that have been around for a while tend to get a little bit more confident and a little bit more relaxed. So the ones who tend to be more risk averse, sometimes they're the ones that are sharing, sharing these data for the first time. And it, it comes back to trust. So it's very important for, for us as a data access provider to demonstrate trustworthiness. Comes back to, to what Henry was saying. Okay. Maybe a um, small follow-up question on that. When you connect this information to the um, GDPR code of conduct, is there a connection? Like the organization could maybe formulate some of their guide, guide let's say, internal guidelines in this GDPR code of conduct and then define what... I think I very quickly answer that already. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, that would be a, a really good conversation to have. I agree. Yes, yeah. we so can we have that conversation. Back to that also. Yeah. So great example of uh, on, on how to build trust, and I think the next presentation we will also uh, uh, show how to build trust and how to open 
access to research data. So this will be a presentation by Holly Wright, uh, who is the uh, who works for the archaeology data service uh, that is a national archive uh, for archaeological data in the UK. And her research focuses on field drawing, vector graphics, visualization, web standards, and the semantic web in archaeology. Uh, she currently manages ADS involvement in a range of projects, including Ariadne Plus and CIADA. And I have no idea what that project is, so but that sounds very interesting as all the acronyms. So please, uh, Holly, floor is yours. So yes, um, I'm Holly Wright I'm with the Archaeology Data Service, uh, and indeed I'm going to uh, speak about a lot of the things that have been uh, brought up already in the session, um, but through a very particular uh, domain lens, which is uh, archaeology. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, is basically a response to what our deliverable uh, was for shock, um, but bringing in a lot of other work um, that was happening at the same time or that we commissioned because we were able to be part of shock. Um, so this is the deliverable that we were uh, tasked with. And when I started thinking about how we should approach this, um, this, is, this was sort of my thought process. So, uh, I mean, archaeology, archaeological data, it's extremely diverse. Um, and so we get used a lot uh, to sort of extrapolate for um, not just social sciences, but also for uh, hard sciences, because we do um, absolutely uh, our part of uh, incorporate all, all manner of um, arts and humanities, but sciences as well. Um, and when I was thinking about, well, what should we, uh, <laughs> what should we focus on? Um, actually, I decided we're actually the ideal test case <laughs> for what we want, what we're, what we've been tasked to look at here. Um, and so we went ahead and and did that. So just a little bit of background about the ADS. Um, again, we are a domain-specific archive, which is a little unusual. Um, we, was, we were set up in 1996, which means we're two years older than Google. Um, that gives you some perspective. <laughs> so the way that we do things, uh, we have a lot of legacy reasons why we do things uh, the way that we do. Um, we have a national remit, um, but we are based, uh, we're embedded within the Department of Archaeology at the University of York. Um, and uh, we are the we are a core trust seal accredited archive. Um, we uh, so obviously preservation is a main part of our remit. We have always been uh, freely and openly available online since our inception. Um, but one of the things that we do that's really important, I think, is um, the fact that we provide uh, guidance um, and support to the data creators, which I'll say a little bit more about later. Um, and obviously we participate in research, which is what I do and why we're here as part of SHOCK. So, uh, so what does the ADS actually hold? So as we start to look at ourselves um, as this test case, um, so uh, primarily you find uh, information uh, from the Archaeology Data Service via something called ArcSearch. Um, so this is uh, an online catalog with 1.3 million uh, metadata records, which include the ADS collection, so the things that we actually archive ourselves. Um, and this includes over a thousand what we call rich data archives. So these can be archives including everything from a particular archeological intervention. So that can be databases, that can be 3D, 3D data, that can be um, uh, geophysical data, whatever went into that particular archeological intervention uh, goes into one of these rich archives. Um, but then we also uh, have been pulling together uh, all of the, what we call gray literature, so all of the unpublished archeological field reports, um, which are basically the output of 90% of the archeology span that happens in the UK. It's all done in advance of construction. Um, the NICE research projects are actually very much the exception. Um, and 
we aggregate the metadata from over 30 uh, national and uh, regional historic environment inventories. So we're aggregating from sort of one person uh, organizations that undertake archeological or architectural uh, research um, all the way up to the national bodies uh, that are much larger than we are. So what do we disseminate? Um, obviously we disseminate the data that we hold. Um, we, oh, are you having virtual hearing? Yeah. Oh dear, you should have said, I can stand closer to the microphone. <laughs> Uh, is this better? I do apologize. Somebody, somebody should have said something sooner. Um, right, so we disseminate the data that we hold, uh, and we um, obviously provide, we act, we act as a data aggregator for other organizations as well. Um, and then, of course, obviously we disseminate things out also uh, to larger aggregators during, via the sort of uh, typical uh, methods that you might expect. Um, so some of the larger infrastructures where we uh, send our data out into, um, so Europeano is one, um, but also primarily uh, the Ariadne uh, infrastructure, um, and this is the Ariadne portal, which is the, uh, an international infrastructure specifically for archaeological data. First time that one's happened. Okay. Um, <laughs> so it's also important to talk a little bit about how archaeological data is a bit different to other types of social sciences and humanities data. So um, because uh, archaeological research is non-repeatable, so when you excavate a site, you destroy the site. I don't know if people necessarily realize that whenever you see archaeology happening in the field and you see people doing this very careful recording of what they are, uh, of what they are seeing in the ground, that is that then becomes the primary data. Um, and as we all know, digital data is incredibly fragile, and archaeologists have always been inc really early adopters when it comes to using digital methods. So we have a bit of a conundrum if we don't figure out ways to <laughs> ways to um, deal with uh, the long-term stewardship of our data. Uh, we're, we're really in trouble. So this is why people like me who work with archaeological data are obsessed with preservation and data persistence because for us, it's we only get one shot basically with this data. Um, also, archaeological data is typically very heterogeneous and difficult. So we basically say if you can, uh, if you can archive archaeological data, you can archive anything. Um, and yeah, we are completely omnivorous when it comes to uh, the different types of uh, research tools and methodologies. If it can answer our research questions, we'll use it. The example that was uh, given yesterday um, about using historians who are trying to understand the collapse of the Roman Empire, uh, using environmental data that showed that there was a climate, there was some sort of climate crisis that accelerated the collapse of the Roman Empire, that's environmental archaeology. That's what we do. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a good case study uh, for a lot of different things. So um, how did we actually go about implementing this? So um, doing uh, an overview, basically we just did an overview of the fair landscape to sort of situate ourselves and kind of how, how far along we were. Um, but mostly what we did um, was a really in-depth assessment of our own level of fairness, which was not something we had done before. Um, but then we also wanted to, you know, this was very much, that was very much qualitative and we wanted to make sure that we were also um, doing some sort of uh, automated assessment, um, which I'll talk more about as well. Um, and then uh, we did a whole lot of uh, really in-depth discussion about what, what we found out basically and how um, we can uh, have these how we can sort of change our workflows um, in, in order to improve the fairness uh, within our, our core trustee accredited uh, workflows. So um, this is the, 
So this uh, is essentially uh, the main audit that we did, and this was, um, we made sure that this was led by somebody who uh, was one of our senior archivists, and we also, he was also the person who did our court seal accreditation so that we could, so that he fully understood kind of what the implications were of what we were doing. Um, but what we realized was that we really wanted to do both an internally and externally facing set of reports. Um, so the internal report is very much uh, looking at strategically going forward, what, what are we going to do, how can we measure our progress, um, but then we also thought it would be really important to do an external report uh, for our users in order to be more transparent about what we're doing. So uh, this is actually, if anybody wants to look at this, basically what I, what I, what I call this is like a worked example of a particular domain assessing its own fairness. Um, so you can have a look at that. Uh, and basically we thought, you know, archaeologists, most of them aren't and shouldn't be, frankly, <laughs> familiar with the FAIR principles. Um, but we thought by doing this and just putting it out publicly on our website that um, we're, all, we're always trying to sort of make a case as well to our uh, depositors about how, um, basically, why you should care about this. Well, you know, funders are looking for it now. Um, it's something that you can use as an impact indicator. So putting it out there so they can actually cite it and use it, uh, we thought would be really helpful. Um, obviously, it's about best practice, and we'll keep updating it as we go along. So, but at the same time, we were really um, mindful of the fact that uh, the FAIR principles are, are really meant to be about machine actionability. And we thought, well, how can we, we feel like we understand qualitatively what we're doing, but how could we then push this um, further. So we got in touch with um, the Ferris Fair project and asked if we could, uh, if they would be willing to just collaborate with us informally. It wasn't part of Ferris Fair. They were just very kind uh, and were willing to work with us. Um, and uh, obviously these are, you'll all be familiar with the different sort of uh, test cases, but we thought, well, would you would like to have us as a test case too? And they said yes. Um, so we basically, uh, I'll just give you a couple quick examples of what we found out. So this is kind of the way that the report is set up. So we've got, so this is a simple one, obviously. It's very straightforward. Um, this is what we uh, externally said. So this is where we're telling people this is where we are now. Internally, here's a recommendation for our strategic planning that we're gonna go forward with. And then the Fuji assessment for this one was okay. <laughs> so that's easy. More difficult though. Um, for, for this one, uh, metadata use vocabularies that follow fair principles. Externally, we were able to say, yes, we do that. Here are all the vocabularies that we use. Here are the links to them if you want to find out more about them. Um, and then internally, we were able to come up with a range of things that we, of course, still could be doing better. Um, and, and the thing that I think is really interesting about this particular one is the fact that um, they're all, two of the three are really focused on the data creators. It's about us using the FAIR principles to understand what we're, how, how practice should be changing in order to uh, do them well, and having to feed back to the data creators, oh, we'd like you to have your data in a slightly different way, do something slightly differently, which I don't think happens quite as much. Um, so it was really useful for that aspect for me anyway. Um, but what does Fuji say? Fuji says no. <laughs> Fuji said the whole thing failed. Um, and uh, so basically the vocabularies that we're using, you know, I guess we could sort of argue with Fuji and say, well, maybe we agree, maybe we disagree. And that's uh, something we did have a lot of discussion about that. Um, but at the same time, uh, there were still things that we could take from that and absolutely finally uh, being able to see, you know, are we actually doing this in a machine actionable way? Well, no, there are things that we could change to improve that. 
so I will just sort of end with this. Um, I had more slides, but I took them out to try to stay on time. <laughs> um, just to say that we also undertook, as part of our remit, was to do this review of the solutions adopted across Europe. Um, and fortunately, because um, the uh, Basically, concurrently, um, we were involved in, uh, in a core way with both um, Ariadne Plus, which is the second four-year development phase of the Ariadne uh, portal development, um, alongside um, also being chairs of the SIADA cost action. And um, SIADA is, it stands for Saving European Archaeology from the Digital Dark Age. And I know that's really hyperbolic. <laughs> But I honestly, I think it's true. I, we, this, is, this is basically what we, what we found out is that um, the gap uh, of people who were able to participate in an aggregation platform like Ariadne Plus, like a lot of the things we've been talking about for the last two days, that gap is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger because we're not attending to the stewardship side uh, nearly enough and, and, and dealing with what I call the myth of persistence. <laughs> There's this assumption you put something out there and once you do that, it's gonna stay there, it's always gonna be there, and that, at least in archeology, span is very much the exception and not the rule, and we really do need to address that, and that is, that's very much what SIADA is about. Um, so there were two things going on at the same time. So there was the, uh, this survey that was done for Ariadne, which was specifically looking at uh, survey practices, and there is information in there about the fairness, even though we didn't ask specifically, we didn't use the fair terms, we were still asking those questions. Um, and then uh, what was meant to be another online survey, but because of COVID, uh, resulted in a 28 paper special issue um, that is basically looking at what sort of the state of the art is in, I think it's 14 different countries and regions and nations in Europe, um, but also the US, Japan, Argentina, and Israel as well, um, to just sort of, so there's an analysis of both of those things in there, uh, looking at the indirect information about fairness that sort of situates uh, where archeology span is and, and, and how we're doing. So if you're interested in that, I'll just leave that there. Um, so yes, uh, the conclusion basically is that trying to understand how to do these things in practice, how to really work this example, um, it can be implemented, it can be assessed, communicated, and improved. Um, and if we can do it for archaeological data, once again, you can you can almost do it for anything. So, thanks. Yes, absolutely. It's, uh, um, we have to, yes, it's completely changed the way, and, and I'll, yeah, I'll tell you one way that it's changed, um, how we practice, uh, which in some ways is a little sad, um, because one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, we, we like to understand ourselves, we like to understand our own discipline, and we have in our archive so many wonderful photos of people doing archaeology and especially children engaging in archaeology and enjoying archaeology and of course that has all had to be stripped out of our um, anything that's public facing at least I mean we keep we, we've kept them but they're not obviously we've had to change uh, what we can make available because of GDPR um, which you know that's a research data set that's not kind of available anymore, and for good reasons, of course, but it's a thing, <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe it could be made available to investigate. With sensitive, yeah. yes, yeah. we could do sensitive, yeah. yep, yep. <laughs> could you not involve some seeking of consent? Is that a way for the monitoring? Yes, uh, yeah. 
the question was whether it's not possible to have some seeking of consent to use the imagery. Uh, absolutely, but when you're dealing with things, photos that were taken 30 years ago, it's just not, it's just not possible, so yeah. But going forward, we, we certainly do, yes. I've got a question about, um, let's say, code of conduct was mentioned before, right, on the basis of the GDPR. Uh, is, is the GDPR for the SSH now the only thing we have to look on? I mean, there are also ethical things uh, that we have to, I think, comply to. For archaeology, uh, there is, for instance, I know, I know ju just an example, there was a fresh ex excavation, and they kept the, uh, let's say, that, that out of the news because they were afraid that all kind of amateurs would kind of stomp over the place and make it, uh, you, you know this practical. The same thing goes, for instance, for um, anthropology where um, people, um, let's say, make recordings and uh, following the GDPR there is no problem. But there are ethical concerns of just showing these things. So I wonder why isn't there, and let's say wasn't there a task about a SSH code of conduct uh, that also includes looking at the ethical aspects? Because I think currently all this is very fragmented. So who is going to take this? I, I don't know. I mean, I can speak about how we deal, deal with it in archeology, span if that's what you're, yeah. I mean, uh, we don't, literally, we just have different levels of access I, in terms of, uh, we'll, we'll just make you know, the location of a site into a polygon where you can't necessarily, you don't know the exact point where, s where something is. Um, so there, there are ways to handle it, but also um, obviously making sure that people with the right sort of credentials yeah, have yeah, access yeah. At, different, at different levels. A bit like uh, uh, biologies and uh, endangered species, you know, they, they, they hide that, they hide that up. So, but I'm wondering <laughs> if we are talking about code of, con co code uh, of conduct. It's, it's, it's an important com comment in, in, and in uh, both work package five and eight, we've also looked at ethical issues. But I didn't talk about it today because I was talking about well a GDPR code of conduct, but, but there, uh, um, the ethical issues are much wider because it concerns yeah, other things than personal data. But not personal. less important. It is if it's the GDPR is, let's, of course, it's a legal uh, requirement, so it's important. But I think there is more uh, to, to take care of. Yeah. So it's, it's very important to, ad to address also ethical issues. And, and we've made a report addressing both the legal and ethical issues that I think it's yeah. published. Yeah. yeah. So I can send you the link. I was just going to add um, a comment from the secure data access perspective as well, because ethics is not a huge part yet of the process. It, it is funny enough in the UK, but it's new. So the Office for National Statistics brought in a mandatory requirement for ethics assessments with all research proposals. But this is, this is relatively new, so that came in just before the pandemic. So there's a lot of work to be done. I, I would absolutely agree with ethics. It's, the conversation is there, but it's, yeah, it, it has a way to go yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I thank you. I, I, could, I could see Marieke there, so I guess we need to, it, it's, it's about time to end and go to lunch. But uh, before we go, I'd like to thank all the presenters and uh, I think there are a lot of discussions. Did we have one more question? Quick one? Yeah, just a very short one. I mean, all this sensitive data, data protection, etc. we keep the data for a very long time, particularly in archeology, span so in 100 years we de-embargo this data and it's open because people are dead? That's the plan or how, how do you deal with that? You don't know how long people will live, so. <laughs> I don't know how it can be, can be answered that shortly, I mean, but uh, core trust seal, uh, trusted, uh, core trust seal uh, certified repositories will keep your data there alive. Right? Uh, yes, and professors like to uh, go to their grave with their entire data sets under their beds still. That's the whole thing. 
Um, but what, but one thing that I would say is um, that hasn't come up is there there are all of these ethical questions that archaeologists are working with. We may just not be working with them in in the avenues that you would you might be looking for them. So, for example, um, the care principles. Has anyone heard of the care principles? Yeah. Okay. So the, uh, that is about how. Um, because very often archaeologists and anthropologists go into other communities and are working with people, making recordings of, of uh, stories, experiences, or uh, working with an international team. Um, the care principles, I would really recommend people have a look uh, at that because that is about how you ethically uh, collect data from in a, in a way that is collaborative and respectful, um, which is maybe a little bit different than what we're talking about, but these are all things that archaeologists are working with all the time, so. Okay, thank you. So there's work to do, so fair principles, care principles, trust principles, quarter seal, and keep these in mind, and the landscape picture that we never got back into. Uh, but it, yeah, it was a great discussion, great presentations, and thank you everybody, have a nice lunch. <laughs>